Okay, folks, let's make a start. So I think we're going to get squeezed into the round, so uh, we need to get going. So in 2011, Ryan, along with five other hackers, splintered away from Anonymous to ultimately form the now infamous hacking fraternity Lulzac. During a 50-day spree in May and June 2011, they were allegedly responsible for attacks upon the CIA, Serious Organised Crime Agency, United States Senate, NATO, United States Navy, the FBI, AT&T, Fox, Sony, the Sun newspaper, the Times. This is a non-exhaustive list, right? So I'll stop there because we've only got the room for an hour. Mostly claiming to do this for the lols, they gave a lot of large organisations a serious headache. Perhaps the largest headache belonging to Aaron Barr and H.B. Gary, but I don't want to ruin that tale for you. I think Ryan's a better place to tell that one. I do want to say this, though. Ryan will be talking about illegal hacking. He does not condone this activity any longer, and is keen to turn over a new leaf. Ryan was sentenced to two years and six months in prison for these crimes, be very sure illegal hacking is no joke. If you want to hack, there are other ways. Study with us, become a pen tester, or make your fortune chasing bug bounties. In other words, kids, don't try this at home. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Ackroyd. Well, like David says, um, I'm Ryan, and this, this is the first lecture I've ever done, so ho hopefully it goes okay. But uh, I'm just going to explain how one simple mistake can lead to, lead to catastrophic damage. I mean, the, the, the things I'm going to be explaining in this uh, lecture today, um, one mistake ruined an entire company. And if... Um, I'll, 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 I'll explain it, and you'll, you'll see. Anonymous is, um, is an, an online group of uh, act activists who they, they stand for freedom of speech, freedom of information, and they've, um, they help other act activists across the world, and they, they protest all over the world. And I, was a, I was a part of Anonymous in 2010, and um, I did some uh, very, very naughty things. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 2010, Wikileaks, uh, has, it, has anyone in here heard of it, Wikileaks? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, back in 2010, uh, Pri uh, Private Bradley Manning, he, um, he gave a lot of um, military cables to, the, to, to Wikileaks, and Wikileaks started releasing them to the public. But PayPal decided to stop the donations to, to, to Wikileaks it's still perfectly okay to donate to the KKK and various other Nazi organizations, just not Wikileaks. Because PayPal cut off um, donations to Wikileaks, Anonymous started Operation Payback. Operation Payback was, um, it, it, it was a DDoS attack against various pay payment processes such as PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, and for, for organisations like that, you, you'd think that it'd take um, take a lot of effort to, to fetch them down, but Anonymous managed it. They, they crashed all three websites for about a week and caused the companies a, a lot of financial damage. This is the tool that Anonymous used, uh, the, the low-orbit ion cannon. Anyone can download this. It's used for stress testing servers, so... You, you'd put in the IP address of your server and you'd be able to test your server against DDoS. Well, what Anonymous did is they, they, they placed this tool out there and they asked whoever, who, who was it, whoever was following Anonymous to download this tool and point the, point the IP address towards Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, and together thousands upon thousands of people across the entire, entire world joined together and successfully brought down PayPal, which PayPal gets probably hundreds of thousands of visitors per day. So you can imagine the amount of people that it must have taken to fetch down such an organization. This is uh, just, just a tweet from, um, from one of the Operation Payback accounts saying Visa. 
contact visa. Twitter was um, it, it was used a lot to, to get the message out. I mean, you can, you can type something on Twitter and it can get retweeted in seconds, and then people all the way across the world know about it. It's, um, it's becoming more and more used by activists to, to spread messages and get messages out to other people. There are the three, three companies, PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, again, big, big companies dropped drop within a couple of hours of people running the law a bit, I don't care. Distributed dial of service attacks. Does everyone, does everyone actually know what a, a, a DDoS attack is? Yeah. And it, well, for those that don't know, it's, it's, it's simply overloading. You, you just send a massive amount of junk data to, to a target, such as a web server, that it cannot handle that many requests, that it either it crashes under the weight of the traffic or it just, or it just denies access to le legitimate users. There's different types of DDoS. There's, TCP packet flood just sends a bunch of TCP packets. UDP, same, just sends UDP packages to the to the target. HTTP flood, it can do guess, uh, HTTP get requests, post. Basically, it's like you, you could have it downloading a big file on a web server over and over again to, to drain out the, the bandwidth of the server. It's not so much a problem these days, but a couple of years back, when you rented a server or anything like that, you, you, you rented so much bandwidth for the server, and if you used up all the bandwidth of the server, you had to pay for more. And back in the day, they used to use like image leeches, and they'd find all the images on your website, and they'd put them in a in a file that uh, like a, you could put it in like a recursive wget script, and it'd just download all the files from the web server over and over again to chew up all the bandwidth. And, and the, the biggest part of like DDoS, it, it, it mostly comes from botnets, people who own thousands upon thousands of infected computers that they control from, from sometimes a single location, sometimes it's done over peer-to-peer. -peer. Botnets get more and more advanced, and th things like CryptoLocker, GoZoos, they're using a, a lot more advanced things than what, what did they do, did do a couple of years back. But they're mostly used for DDoS attacks, to send a bunch of spam, steal personal information and spread other types of, of malware. And the botnet that we used in our attacks to fetch down uh, the CIA, it was, I think, it was something like 100,000 nodes at peak, but to have 100,000 computers on at a single time, the infection rate must be within the million because not all the computers are going to be on at the same time, if, they, if that makes sense. And I, I didn't actually own the botnet that was, uh, that was owned by someone else, and um, I was never actually involved in any distributed denial of service. I was more into penetrating into web servers and then pivoting, pivoting into networks and discovering vulnerabilities in source code. And, but yeah. And there's different, different reasons why people do DDoS. I mean, sometimes it's just out of spite to crash a web server that they don't like. Sometimes it's for extortion. Sometimes someone will put your company under a DDoS attack and say, basically, I want this amount of money and I'll stop doing it. And so, some people pay the ransom as well. They will actually pay it. And some people use it tactically as well. I mean, a couple of years back, I used to use a, like if I routed a server, I'd go through the um, like the like the, the the access logs and things like that, and I'd get the IP addresses of the admins, the admin the box, and then what I'd do is I'd put them IPs under a DDoS while I was routing through the system, so they couldn't get on and, and manage it and ca counter what I was doing. After the um, the attacks on PayPal, Visa, and Mastercard. A company known as HB Gary Federal made a, they made a statement in the Financial Times basically saying that they're going to identify the people involved and unmask the leaders of Anonymous. I mean, I don't know, does anyone actually follow the, like the, the Anonymous drama and hacker culture in general online? Basically, the, the, there is no leaders of Anonymous. Anonymous is just a group of people. Anyone can be anonymous. Anyone can stand up and say, I am anonymous, and you are instantly anonymous. There's no forum to register. There's no, there's no member roster. There's, 
pretty much, the, it's a decentralized movement. Anyone and everyone can be anonymous. There's people from all walks of life, law, police, education, just general people, people who work in the corner shop. There's people from all walks of life. But this company, apparently, we're going to expose the leaders of it, Anonymous. This is um, Aaron Barr. He was the uh, CEO of HB Gary Federal. And it, it was Aaron Barr who, cl who claimed in the Financial Times that he was um, able to uh, identify us and he was uh, planning on selling the information that he'd gathered to the FBI. And he... Um, he he made a few. He made a few mistakes. And <laughs> does, has, has anyone heard this story before? No, no. <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> Very funny. Yeah. That is Aaron Burr. HV Gary. They were um, a cyber security company. They um, they developed uh, software for de detecting malware. It basically, they use like digital DNA to, to detect like various traits in malware to help them better understand it and detect it. And they um, this, they uh, they did a lot of government contracts for the three-letter agencies in America, the the FBI, the the NSA, and pretty much if you can name a three-letter agency, these people had a, a a contract for them. And for a cyber security company, the security was it it, it was it was minimum. It was very minimum, but. Basically, um, one of the scripts on the, web, on the web server was vulnerable to an SQL injection attack. In an SQL injection, it's, um, it's, like the, it's like the bottom of the bottom of vulnerabilities. You know what I mean? It takes no effort at all to sanitize input in a PHP script. But for a cybersecurity company, they, they, they couldn't audit their, their own source code, apparently. It's, it's, it's a nightmare, you know. From a single injection, from a single SQL injection, we managed to um, we managed to harvest the uh, user database, and none of their MD5 passwords stored in their database were salted at all. They were all just 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 normal M MD5, normal message digest five. The, the the MD5 algorithm algorithm is sound. There's absolutely no weakness in it. Well, at least not that's been found or disclosed, but. There are various attacks to re re reverse a hash to a, to, to a plain text, either by brute forcing or using what's known as rainbow tables. And rainbow tables are, it's basically if you convert an entire dictionary of words into a hash, and then you save all them hashes with their uh, corresponding clear text, and then you can do a quick lookup of the hash, and then you just match it <coughs> until you get the password. Using the, um, using the hashes that we got from the HP Gary, uh, HP Gary Federal database, we, um, we ran a rainbow, rainbow table attack on it, and we found uh, Aaron Barr's password was kibafo 33 which is, um, again, a cyber security guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's no capital letters. There's no special characters. There's, how many is that? Three, six... At least it's eight characters, the minimum standard for most places. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah. Um, the, um, the, the worst thing as well, the, the, the people in the database, the, the passwords that we managed to uh, reverse using uh, rainbow tables, um, they use the same password for everywhere, uh, uh, absolutely everything. Uh, the, the, the personal social media accounts, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Amazon, Aaron Barr used the same password for his World of Warcraft account, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, a few people had a bit of fun logging into into that and dumping all his um, goods. <laughs> um, using um, using some of the passwords that we gained uh, from, from the database, we were able to uh, access their SSH, which just just by using a username and password. I mean, these days. Every, well, a, a secure SSH connection will use private keys with a passphrase. But again, cybersecurity company using standard login for SSH. 
and using the same passwords everywhere for <laughs> critical systems. The system that we got into basically had all their company information, all their NDA agreements, their non-disclosure agreements, and stuff that you wouldn't really want anyone to get, basically. But um, like I said, all the all social media was compromised. Aaron Barr, he was the um, administrator of the HP Gary Federal's Google Apps. So he, he, he basically had access to all the employees' emails as well. And because Aaron Barr loves, loved to use his password everywhere, we, we were able to log into the Google Apps as Aaron Barr. And because he was the administrator, we managed to download, I think it was around 70,000 company emails from, from various employees which um, is, is quite, quite a lot. <laughs> and like I said, after we got access to the SSH, for, again, for a cyber security company, they were running a, an outdated uh, Linux kernel, and they were vulnerable to a really, really old local root exploit. So from, um, it was actually Ted, Ted, Ted Vera's account that we um, logged into on SSH. And from his account, we, we managed to root, root, root the server, gain root, and from, from there we were, we were able to, well, basically have as wicked way with his server. <laughs> it, the, the damage to the company, it was, it, it, was, it, it was massive, and all this is just from one SQL injection. If we have never SQL, in, SQL injected the, the, the website. We'd have never, we'd have never got the hashes. We'd have never been able to log into their SSH. I mean, the the further and further that, that we went, it seemed to get worse and worse. They were recycling passwords everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And you know what I mean. And it's it's, it's just generally not a good idea. If if you've got um, if, if you've got more than one one account, you know what I mean. You need to at least. Uh, you need to use a different password for every account. I mean, there's things like keep pass and different password managers that you can put a little word in and then it'll gen generate you a massive password. So it does all the work for you, basically. But it's an eight-character password with no capitals, you know what I mean? It's, again, cyber security company, so, apparently. But yeah, from, from, from the box that we rooted, um, one, te one terabyte of company data was destroyed, just, just RM'd, gone. Around 70,000 emails taken from the Google Apps because Aaron Barr used the same password and he was the administrator of it. The, um, the, the company website was, was, was hacked, rooted, defaced. We, we put, a, put a nice message on there for, for them to read. And somehow the, um, the, the database ended up on the internet. It just, it's just it. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> um, and Greg Hogland... Um, He's, a, he's, he's wrote a lot of books. Well, not a lot of books. I think I've read one by him. I might be saying, I might be lying there. I have read at least one of his books to do with, um, he does a lot of work with rootkits and, and malware. And he, um, he owned a website called rootkit.com that specialized in um, rootkit samples and people discussing various rootkits and things like that. And um, he was the um, CEO of HB Gary. HP Gary Federal and HP Gary are two separate companies, and um, it's, uh, the uh, the administrator of Rootkit.com. I think I'm not sure if I pronounce his name right. I think it's Jussi Catano. I think he was the um, security guy for Nokia as well. Um, after we gained access to the Google Apps account, because Aaron Barr was administrator and uses his password everywhere, we were able to log into Greg Hogland's account. And we were able to use this account to social engineer the, the administrator of rootkit.com. I mean, to the admin, I mean, to be fair to him, to, 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 to the admin, the emails were coming from Greg Hogland's account. I mean, we, we were able to find like old, the old password within the email. So we had a bit of knowledge on what the old password was. And the story kind of went like, uh, we're on holiday. I can't remember my password. Can you change my password? He reset the password. Then we talked him into dropping the firewall so we could SSH in. And then, even though that we had opened another connect back shell on a really high port, he sent an email back saying, um, "Is that you that's opened up a high port?" And we just said yes, and he just ignored it. And while we were there, we we we, def we, def we, def we defaced it. We, we locked the admin out. You can't get back on your box. And then we dumped their. Um, uh, dump the database, all the usernames, passwords, emails. 
social media accounts, um, Aaron Barr's Twitter, his LinkedIn, his, um, his World of Warcraft. <laughs> um, <laughs> His, um, his Twitter was used basically to, to give out his social security number and things like that. And, the, um, and Aaron Barr's uh, iPad remotely wiped to just turn to a brick. But, yeah, I'm sure he wasn't too, uh, too happy about that. This is, um, this is the website after it was defaced. I mean, if you read here, I don't know if you can see it right at the back, but... It's, uh, it basically says, this domain has been seized by Anonymous under Section 14 Rules of the Internet. Greetings, H.B. Gary, a computer security company. Your recent claims of infiltrating Anonymous amuse us, and so you are, do your attempts at using Anonymous as a mean to garner press attention for yourself. Because basically that's what he was trying to do. I mean, at the time, Anonymous was in the news <laughs> for, for the attacks on PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa. They were getting a lot of press. And... Um, H.P. Gary Federal wasn't doing too well for contracts, and uh, he, uh, Aaron Barr had the idea that he'd jump on the anonymous bandwagon and claim that he can ident identify anonymous and win contracts for his company, basically. And um, anonymous didn't, uh, didn't react to that too well. <laughs> um, I, what, what could they have done to stop it? It's, it's like I say... SQL injection, if, if we'd have never been able to SQL inject that one script, we'd have never gotten in in the first place. I, it's, it's, it's for both, really. I mean, I know the, the, the developers, they end up being under a lot of pressure to, to produce functional code and things like that. But at the end of the day, if you're a developer and you develop vulnerable code, and your, your boss is pushing you to get it out. And that code goes out there, and then it comes back that it's vulnerable, and people get attacked, and they're going to turn around to you and say, oh, well, why didn't you secure this code? And you say, oh, well, yeah, I tried to, but you said the deadlines, timelines, and just get it out. <laughs> but, yeah, in, for, for developers and IT security professionals and things like that, you really, really, really need to learn how to secure PHP, JSP, ASP, and basically all, mostly the web, the, the web application, because these days it's, it's the, mo the most common vulnerability, especially SQL injection. So many sites <coughs> are vulnerable to SQL injection. In this entire lecture, all the other t uh, victims and targets that I'm going to show you, they were all pretty much done using SQL injection, and they're all, so, they're all pretty big companies. And if it can happen to them, it can happen to absolutely anyone. And it does, and you don't always hear about it. Passwords, again, like, like I said about the passwords, it, they really need to be a combination of upper and lower case, capital letters, lower case, special characters. And passphrases are actually better than passwords, because if you choose a, a word, it's more likely that word's going to be in some dictionary. But if you use a phrase like a, like a sentence or something, then it's, um, it's, it, it's a harder probability that that would be generated. You know what I mean? And again, I mean, this, this is, this is the, main, the main point. Never use the same password in more than one place. Because if... All it takes is one person to get your... If you use this, the same password for all your accounts, all it takes is for one of them places to get hacked, and then they can jump into every, everything else that you own. Patches, security fixes. Like I said, with the, with, with the HP Gary, they, they were running a really, really old kernel that was vulnerable to a really, really old exploit, and it doesn't take two seconds to, up, to upgrade and, 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 and patch. And you'd think for a cyber security company, it'd be something that they'd do on a regular basis, but they don't. But I don't know what, what, what it could have been, complacency. Did they think that it, nothing had ever happened? Uh, I, I really don't know. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you. But regular updates should be um, a part of any security policy. And... You know, a lot of things these days, they automatically update, update anyway. But even then, you can, you can update as much as you want, but no one can defend against a zero-day attack, attack that no one knows 
exists apart from the person that discovers it. But there are different ways that, that you can mitigate against it. After the uh, HP Gary, uh, after the attack on HP Gary, the people involved there was um, there was five five to six of us. At any one time, we decided that we'd create uh, our own group. We named it Lull Security, which basically means laughing at security because it's <coughs> basically non-existent. And the idea was is we were going to use um, low-level attacks like SQL injection, remote file inclusion, local file inclusion to hack the biggest the, the biggest companies that we could basically to make the point that cyber, uh, like the state of cybersecurity is just non-existent. One of the um, <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone see this in the news when, when, when this happened? Uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah. PBS, which is like, it's, 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 it's almost like America's version of the BBC, basically. Um, they, they, they had um, a program about, um, on, on Frontline, about Private Bradley Manning, the guy who gave the... Um, the, the, the cables to, to WikiLeaks, and they, 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 it, was, it was a bit biased, and they, they painted him in a in a in a dark light. They, you know, they, they made him look bad, a lot worse than what he really was. I don't know if it was politically motivated or what, but we didn't we didn't like it. <laughs> so we we decided to have a poke around, see what see what we could do, and we, we found out that they were vulnerable again to a web, web application. Vulnerability. We we exploited them, and uh, we decided to put up a fake story. And the the best thing that we could think of was uh, resurrecting Tupac. <laughs> so here he is, Tupac, still alive in New Zealand. If if you've seen this on the website, would you think this was real? Well, the, a lot of uh, other news agencies also thought it was real. A lot of people started reporting it as as real news, and <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, there was a lot of hip hop groups that were um, doing um, interviews and things like that. They were um, really happy that Tupac's been found, and <laughs> they can't wait to do a collaboration with him. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's not true, though. Sony. I mean, Sony during 2010 to 2012, they. Um, they suffered a lot, a lot of cyber attacks. This is only a small, small list of this. Um, there's a website, um, attrition.org, and um, they've uh, they basically listed every single attack against Sony. And it's um, it, it's a couple of it's a, it's a good few pages. I mean, this is just a small amount. But again, SQL injection. These are the ones that um, Lul Security, the, the the group that I was part of, were responsible for. And it, with, with Sony Japan, 8,500 usernames, email addresses, phone numbers, and password hashes. That was the only one out of all the others that were hacked that were actually salting the password, uh, hashing the passwords in the database. All the others kept all the banking, all the credit card information, login information, passwords, and everything in plain text. So there was no cracking involved. If your password isn't, if your password is in there, it was clear text. So, so any pictures, one million accounts, passwords, email addresses, all in clear text. Sony BMG Belgium, again, all the all the passwords, clear text, no hashing whatsoever. Sony BMG, again, clear text passwords, and the um, the the develop. D developer network with their source code stolen, put onto the internet. I mean, the, it, all, all this is illegal, and thinking back to it, and it's. Um, I do regret a lot of it, like, cause I've been to jail for all this stuff, so nothing that I'm saying in this, I've, um, nothing's really new, it's all known about. I've been com convicted for it all. But it all started against. Cause, um, a guy called uh, Geohot. He found a way to jailbreak the, the PlayStation 3, and he decided to give this information out, tell people how to do it. He made various YouTube videos showing how to, how to 
get around doing it. And Sonia decided to sue him. I think they, um, I think they sued him for a, qu- a, quarter of a, a quarter of a million dollars or something, just for basically modding, mo- modifying the, how the PlayStation 3 worked. And a lot of hackers across the world di- didn't like it. And Sony got assaulted. I mean, the, the PlayStation Network got breached. No one's actually being caught for it. No one's owned up to it. It certainly wasn't me. I, I, I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. I actually um, I got the Black Ops at Christmas. And um, I was gutting myself. I couldn't play. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, they, they, Sony took a lot of stick for, from hackers for, for suing Geohot. And like I said, this is just a, just a small amount of the attacks that happened against Sony. And apparently it's, um, it's still ongoing. Uh, Sony's uh, recently been hacked by... Um, it says um, that it was hacked by the GOP. Apparently they've uh, broke into the internal network and they've, um, they've managed to um, get control of all the office machines and they've replaced all the ho- office machines with a picture saying, hacked by GOP, asking for a ransom before... They're, going to, uh, they're, they're talking about um, dumping all um, Sony pictures, uh, internal information financials and things like that, whether it'll happen, I don't know. Sony might pay them off, they, they might not. But, yeah, attacks against Sony are, st- are still ongoing. It wasn't just attacks against small organisations. I mean, after, after the HB Gary thing, like various three-letter three agencies, such as the FBI, Started, um, started their investigations into <coughs> us and what we were doing, trying to build cases against us and things like that. And um, th- this company, Inf- InfoGuard, they're a partnership between the FBI and private sector, and they, um, they deal a lot with like, critical infrastructure and like, th- threats, threats, well, threats directed towards critical infrastructure and things like that. And for, uh, again, for a cyber security company, can anyone guess how, um, how, they, how they got hacked? SQL injection, yeah, exactly. SQL injection, again, you know, nightmare. But, yeah, 180 passwords from this, um, from this website. Anyone think they use them anywhere else? <laughs> yeah, they, they did. <laughs> um, <laughs> but fr- 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 from this hack, we were able to um, intercept communications between the, the FBI and various other law enforcement and we were able to record uh, conference calls. They, um, they sent out emails to all uh, like to other agencies and things like that, invite, because we, once we got into the server, we managed to use the passwords, the same passwords, to get into their emails, to get into the media accounts, you know, and the same story as HP Gary, and we defaced the website, you know what I mean? But they, uh, they sent emails out with all the uh, pin codes for the phones and things like that, so we were able to just di- dial into the conference calls and listen in to any call that we wanted. And a couple of them ended up on YouTube. You can, you can actually search for them on YouTube. If you, if you go to YouTube, just type in FBI conference call. You can actually hear them discussing what we were involved in. And even though that they, they even say in the call that they suspect that someone, uh, someone else had joined in and was listening, they, they still carried on the conversation. And <laughs> yeah. Unveilance. Um, this is a company that... Um, run by um, uh, Karim Hijazi, I think his name's pronounced. I, I can't really pronounce his name, but it's, it's a little startup company started by Karim, and basically they, um, they specialise in like, data, le- well, da- data <laughs> leakage, penetration, and they, um, they specialise in botnets and sinkhole in botnets. I mean, when, when a botnet sinkhole, it's, uh, it's basically the... Um, they, they, once, they, once they know that the, the, the domains that are used for the botnet, for the command and control, and where the, all the bots are connecting, they, uh, they basically take control of those domains and they'll just point them to a server that they control to stop, um, to basically stop the person that created the botnet from accessing it and using it. They basically just point it to nowhere so, the, so these companies control it. But from the emails, because um, people in cybersecurity apparently all like to use the same password everywhere. We managed to get into his, com- into his company and we managed to SSH into the bot- botnet terminal, well, the, the servers that were being used to, 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 like, to contain all the bots. And from that, we, we, we could have stole, we could have stole the bots if we understood like, how, how the malware actually worked and we were able to interact with it. 
And it was just a case of finding out the, the command to make it download our malware, and we could have just taken it straight off them. But they managed to, they, they, actually, they actually did discover us in their system pretty quick and locked us out pretty quick, but not before we downloaded all their emails. This is just, uh, uh, just a bit in the, in the news of, about what happened between, um, in, well, Infogard and the, um, in, that's his name, Hijazi. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's how you pronounce it. Well, um, there was a bit of back and forth because he tried to claim that we were extorting money from him for his silence and things like that, but that wasn't the case. He was... Um, once, once he found out that we were in his system, we, we sent him a message. Said, "Look, we've got we've got your emails. We're, we've got your, we're, we're in your server. We've got complete we've got complete control of everything." And um, he asked us to talk to him, so we, we, we agreed to meet him in a in a, in a secure in a secure chat room. And we were discussing with him, and um, he, uh, he he he. He was, he was making offers for like um, he, was, he was going to offer inside information on different companies and things like that. And he was. Um, he basically wanted us to eliminate the competition, and obviously we just stringed him along just so we could expose him at the end of it. But he tried twisting it around, saying we were extorting him, and we never cared about money. It's not what we were involved in. If we wanted money, we'd have done it quietly. We'd have done banks, and you'd never heard about it. Basically, we weren't. We didn't care for the money. It was just to prove a point that cybersecurity is non-existent. The sun. And during the time that this happened, it was just going about the, the um, it, it had just come out about the, the, about the phone hacking. Did everyone hear about the phone hacking, where the journalists have been hacking into people's phones? And no, it, it's nothing amazing. I don't even know how, how they call it hacking, because like, the, the old way that voicemail used to work, it, or, like, when, you, when you buy a phone, unless you change the voicemail pin, it's always something default, like 000 or 1234. So it's like, if you, um, you, can, you can basically phone someone's phone from a mobile phone, so you ring the phone, and if it goes to voicemail, if you if you keep hammering on the on the hash key, it'll bring you to the voicemail menu, and then it'll ask you to enter the pin. And if they've never gone to change the pin, it's always zero 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 or one two three four, and you can listen through the messages, and you can even set a set a greeting for them. Yeah. <laughs> and basically, that's what they were doing: uh, stealing voicemails of like celebrities, the the royal family. I mean, uh, um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how far it went, but. Ooh. Who's actually gone to jail for it, though? Can anyone name anyone that's been to jail for it? Colson. Colson? Did he? Did he actually? Yeah. Well, it, you wouldn't see you wouldn't see uh, Murdoch in jail for it, obviously. But yeah, after we heard about the the, the son hacking into phones, we decided to well ha hack the son. <laughs> see, see how they like it. So uh, the son was breached. And we uh, we placed this fake story up saying that Rupert Murdoch's body had been found, and some again some different news organisations believed it and took it as real news. Would anyone believe this if they saw it on a on a news website? No, no, not from the sun. <laughs> These, um, these are just a, a, f a few more organizations and companies that we'd uh, managed to penetrate. Can anyone guess how we penetrated them? <laughs> SQL injection? Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. I mean, the United States Navy. Apart, well, all apart from the CIA. The CIA was never breached by us. We never breached the CIA. There was, um, they were hit with a denial of service attack. And to be fair, there's not much you can do to prevent it. It can be mitigated. You can you can substitute servers and get it, get it to go somewhere else, redirect all the junk traffic. But they didn't, they didn't see it coming, and it was just a a, a web server. It wasn't tied to any serv services that CIA use or anything like that. <coughs> it was it was mostly done just just as a show of the size of the botnet. Really, I mean, I never did any of the DDoS. Though. That were the, the other people in the group. I just I just saw a challenge in getting into a server, and if I couldn't get into it, it just made me want to get into it more. 
So I'd, um, I'd go through, uh, I'd download all the source code, I'd have IDA Pro up, and I'd be going through all the services, just trying to find one weakness in something that I could exploit. And then once I got in, I'd, I didn't really care for the server. I never maintained access. I'd just pass the shells to someone else and let them do whatever they want with it. But the, the NHS, it was a different story. We never meant any harm against the NHS. We found um, four or five um, links that were vulnerable to SQL injection. And we, uh, we emailed the NHS and uh, we told them about the, the vulnerabilities in, in the systems and hopefully they actually patched them. Um, a lot of uh, like internal network manuals, engineer manuals got released from AOL and AT&T, which is like a big telecommunications company in America. <coughs> um, it, that's, that's not even a full, full list of it. I mean, the, there's not enough time in this lecture to, to explain them all. Again, how, how did they get how did they get hacked? LSQL injection, yeah. So yeah. So basically, the, the the point that I want to make with all this, with all this uh, web application exploitation and things like that, is that developers need to need to understand how to create secure code. Because at the end of the day, if all of those scripts had been, been developed securely, none of this would have been possible. And we've gone from a simple SQL injection to a full system compromise. And most of the time, it's took less than a couple of hours. And the, the three big ones, SQL injection, remote file inclusion, local file inclusion, each, each one of them three can be used in a way to get command execution on a server. SQL, it's got, um, it's got, um, it's got commands that you can use in its uh, into-out file, so you can basically inject a PHP script into a file somewhere on the server, and if it's a piece of PHP that, that executes a command, you can get command execution on the box. But it depends, because sometimes things with like add slashes and things like that will strip it out, but you can play with it and actually get a shell on the box through SQL injection. Remote file inclusion, it in, it'll include a, a remote script into the server, and again, run any command that you want. Local file inclusion, it's, it's nothing new, this, but a lot of people seem to think that local file inclusion, it only lets you read files, but you, you, can, you can inject Apache logs with, um, with a piece of PHP code. So if you do a HTTP GET request for an URL, and at the end of the URL you type in a piece of PHP, it gets entered into the Apache logs, then if you LFI to the Apache logs and it, when it fetches it in, it'll pass it as PHP and execute the command. So again, you can get another shell on the server. And the other point that I want to make is if you're an IT security professional, you really, really need to understand the, the languages that are used to create uh, web applications such as PSP, ASP, because it's one thing to point penetration tools like Metasploit at, uh, and try and see if it's vulnerable, but things like that, they only, um, they only test for what is known. They don't actually test for the zero day, the one that's actually going to come up and, and bite you. But the ability to actually go through a piece of code and actually find the vulnerabilities in it before an attacker does, you, you can patch them and then you, you're secure. You can actually say that this web application is secure. <coughs> but it, it doesn't happen, as we've seen with HP Gary, with InfraGuard, oh, Security guys obviously don't audit their own source code, but if, if you're a security guy, it, you really, really do need to learn the languages used to create web, web applications. Again, all of this um, very illegal. Like I say, these um, it, it, it didn't look that fancy when it came for me, but <laughs> the, I, I, I was arrested. This is. Um, Slightly smaller than my cell list. Well, yeah, I, I was arrested. I was sent to prison for, for doing all this, quite rightly. It's, uh, it's illegal. Um, I was sentenced to 30, 30 months in prison. I'd done 10, 10 months, and I was released for five, five months on tag. But, you know, and I look, I look back at it, and I, I do regret it, because it's just, it's just a waste of life in prison. I mean, while, while I was in prison as well, it's... Um, so I was banned from computers for a long, long time. And while I was in prison, it's like, you have to either have a job or be in education, or you lose privileges like having a TV in your cell, allow, being allowed to wear your own clothes and things like that. So I chose the education. I just put my name down for anything. 
And then I got called to the office saying, they say, oh, yeah, we've, we found something for you. And here I am banned from computers. And they say, oh, it's a computer course. <laughs> so obviously I couldn't turn it down or they were going to take my TV. So I, I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And um, they, um, they gave me the modules. And rather than sit the lessons, I just, uh, I just completed the, um, the assignments and things like that. I managed to do the, in, the entire course within a couple of months, like three, four months. And I, do, I, I went, went from the, the bottom and I managed to complete a diploma in it. And I think um, I'm probably the only person in the world to walk out of prison with a diploma for the thing that I went in for. <laughs> but like I say, it's, it, it's illegal, but the good skills to have, whether you're a developer, security guy, because at the end of the day, if you know how to do the attacks, you know how to test your code, test your systems, and you can always find that, that zero day, the, the, the one that the pen testing software like Metasploit isn't going to find for you. And then he, even then, there might be something else, but at least you can say, I've done everything I can to secure this application. Things like the, like the there was none of this. Uh, I, mean, I started to learn all this when I was like 11, 12 years old, when I used to hack online games like uh, Command and Con Conquer was the big one, doing a lot of hex editing and learning how to like get more money and infinity life and just being childish with online games. But a lot, I learned a lot of assembly and programming from it. But there was nothing like the bug bounty when I was uh, when I was around back then. So there was nowhere to really use these skills other than for illegal means. But Companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, PayPal, Nokia, they all, um, they all offer bounties. If you find a, like a vulnerability in any of their software or any of their products and you, you tell them about it, sometimes there's a ca cash reward for it. But it's, um, it's good as well for the reputation as well. So it's like if you're a security guy and you want to build up a good re reputation, you know what I mean? it's something good that you could put on your CV as well. I mean, if you find a, found a bug in Google, and you had that on your CV and you went for a job anywhere, and you say, look, I found this bug in Google, uh, you, you, you'd probably just walk into a job. This is the, um, this is the picture from the, uh, the other day. This is the, this is the SHU uh, Ethical Hacking Society. And this was, um, I don't know, is, is Wes here today? Is he? Oh, is he? <laughs> is he? Uh, this is, um, did, did you stay for the full 24 hours? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I think that was the last time I was there. This was a 24-hour hackathon for, for the um, SHU uh, Ethical Hacking Society and things like this, you know what I mean? And uh, the guys were doing the, the bug crowd and the, the, the bug bounty looking for bugs in software. So there are legal ways of doing it, you know what I mean? It's the, the illegal way. If I could go back and just turn my computer off and, and walk, walk away, I, pro I probably would do, you know what I mean? Because none of it was worth the jail. I actually sat in jail and I, th I thought to myself, what have I done? I've wasted my life. And I've, um, I've started a co course here and I'm, I'm doing a master's uh, degree in um, information system security. And even if I finish this, there's still going to be a massive trust issue. So I'm still probably going to find it difficult to get into industry because of my criminal record and because of what I've done. But it's... Um, I don't know, for, for me, it's just about changing what, changing what I've done and trying to do better, and hopefully I can give something back into cybersecurity and hopefully help develop better, better means of defending against the kind of attacks that we did, even though that they are really, really simple attacks. Questions? Yeah. What did they find with you? Um, there were, um, at first, they, um, uh, there was a guy in America, uh, Hector Xavier Monsega, and basically they um, they captured him and they were they were using him to inform on us, but he never had any inf information on me. And um, what I wanted to do is after the HB Gary thing, I was going to walk away from the internet. I was just going to throw my computer in the bin and have done with it. So I decided to write a script to to like log into my Twitter account and post a random sentence to make it look like I was still online. But because I was going to upload that script to a hack server. I wasn't cared about sending it through a proxy or VPN or anything like that. And um, my machine locked up, and I did what some people do when the machine locks up, just, just bash the keyboard and hope it comes back to life. But I accidentally, accident, I accidentally executed the script, and it connected to Twitter, and it put my IP in Twitter's logs. And um, four months had passed, and I'd still not been arrested or anything. I, mean, I, got, I, I, I knew what happened. As soon as it, as soon as it happened, I, I just got rid of the computer, basically. Um, and then four months had passed, and I thought, well, they're, they're not coming. 
So I started tapping away again, and that was it. I got arrested. So it was my own, my own, my own mistake. We've got about five minutes for some more questions. Yeah. Any more questions? No, correct. that's correct. Was that because you couldn't? You couldn't find a way into it? No, it, <laughs> it's just that, uh, lull, lull sec, it was, it was different people. And um, for, for a period of it, um, a lot of websites like the CIA got DDoS, EVE Online got DDoS, and um, what was the other? League of Legends got, got DDoS as well. But that was done by three separate people within lull sec. And we didn't always collaborate on everything, if you know what I mean. And that was like their, their thing. And I, I concentrated more on just, just get, getting root on the server. That's all I really cared about. The, the DDoS thing, it's, it's nothing. It, it's, it just, there was nothing appealing to it to me at all. Um, uh, when you were arrested, the police come in and smash your door down, did they, or did they just knock the door? Oh, they <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, they actually sneaked into the house. The house was unlocked. I just woke up and I was... Uh, uh, I, I, was, I was still in there, like doing my morning routine, and the, uh, the the door was unlocked, and they snuck into the house. And when they came into the room to get me, they were um, they, they both tried to fit through the door at the same time to try and lunge at me, <laughs> and they, they both got stuck in the door, and they're, they're trying to push past each other. And yeah, that, they, it was a it was a quiet entry. But uh, when they first come, they all came in plain clothes, and because they didn't actually shout police. I've just seen these two um, two big guys in uh, plain clothes. I'm thinking I'm getting robbed or I'm getting done in or something. You know what I mean? And yeah, it, it was a bit scary. Was scary. Um, did you or anybody else in Lonsdale consider using a backdoor? On. Um, when you would, instead of using SSH, would you use a backdoor? Surely backdoors are easier because when you have access, then. Well, it's the. SQL injection was the initial entry into the server, and what you do is you gain a foothold like that until the point that you can execute commands on the server. And once you can start executing commands, you can escalate privileges using like a, a local root exploit. And then once you gain root, you'd backdoor the server so you can come in and out as much as you want. But because we were just going for the straight pwn and interface, there was no need to maintain access because we were going to rem the box anyway. Uh, any more questions? Why and how did you get started with Mulsec and Anonymous? Was it boredom or the challenge? Um. A bit of both, boredom, boredom, and I did see a lot of it as a challenge because, like I say, I was, it is, it, it was kind of addictive, you know what I mean? But I saw it as a challenge to get into a server, especially if I've seen loads of people that are trying to do it and they couldn't get in. So I just, it just made it more of a challenge for me to try it, if if, if that makes sense. But I did. Um, because I'd, I'd done about five years in the army, and when uh, when I left the army, I basically had no qualifications or anything. All I'd done is um, just learnt to learn hide in bushes and shoot people, basically. Was, and um, I, 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 I was finding it hard to get a job, so most of the time I was sat at home behind a computer, and I, I kind of sunk into the online world of, of hacking, and, and it, it, it got a bit murky after that. <laughs> Learn all these skills. I mean, okay, you were in the army and you, you said that you didn't have too much skills. How did you actually learn all because it actually requires a, a good amount of knowledge to do all that, all these tasks? How did you actually learn all those skills? It's like when I was um, about 14, 15, well, I've been doing it since like 11, 12, like, but mostly it started from hacking online games because I, I used to like play a lot of like Command and Conquer and things like that and Counter Strike back in the day. And I used, to, I used to love being able to cheat online, you know what I mean? Just, just have that extra edge against the person that you're playing against. Being able to have infinite money, God mode, you know what I mean, online. And you just, just ruin them and you just, you just hear them and just, like, they, they, they get wound up about it. And I learned how to like, do a lot of hex editing and stuff like that. I would, like learning how to hex edit the, the game and call different things in and make the game do different things. And I, I learned a lot of um, assembly from it as well. And I it just went from there learning to program, basically. And then as, as it went on from there, like exploiting games, I got into exploiting software. And then I met a lot, uh, well, not a lot, but a few people that were into buying exploits in software. And because uh, zero day exploits, they sell for quite a bit of money. And there's, there's money to be made. I never actually made any money from it. But um, I, I did give, a, we give quite a few away. But, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, you've got a lot of 
So that's a different style. Unfortunately, I think we have got another class coming. I've just seen the door go, which is normally somebody wants to come in after us. So I'd just like everybody to thank Ryan in the usual way, please, for the time.